All right, we live and we dancing. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Winner's Circle. I'm super excited about this episode. And the goal of this podcast is to bring you guys people who are going for their win in the real world. And what that means is people who are doing what's harder than mediocrity. Mediocrity is following the traditional career model, doing what you know, you, you're you kind of expected to do, and going for your win means you are following your passion, you are answering your calling, you are doing what you know you can do to help other people and listening to that drive. So I'm super stoked for this week's um, guest. I wrestled and did judo and currently I'm doing jiu-jitsu trying to get into it um and i'm uh, i'm also a personal trainer so derek if you would please introduce our amazing guest for this week absolutely and i have a bit of a longer introduction than normal today um because i don't want to get too much into um like these these details we're, we're is all over the internet um our guest has been on joe rogan experience multiple times that's when i first have heard of him on his 2016 appearance and i've been listening to him and following along ever since Born in 1952, today's guest, 67 years old, a legend, period. He started physical training at age 12, and then shortly thereafter started training people professionally as an undergrad at Westchester University of Pennsylvania, where he holds a master's degree in exercise science. He ran one of the first Nautilus gyms in eastern United States, and then founded Maxercise Sports Fitness in Philadelphia, PA, the first gym in the U.S. to offer scheduled kettlebell classes. Although he no longer recommends kettlebell training, and we'll get into that. Train smart people. Um, the first American-born Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt under Helson Gracie. While he was running Maxercise, he simultaneously taught and ran the first Brazilian jiu-jitsu school in the eastern U.S. And then the divorce. Now without a home, now without a gym, he ditched all his possessions accumulated over the years, moved into a camper van, and started traveling all around the United States, living off his savings. As money ran out, he had to return to the corporate world shortly, where he worked with Gentech Pharmaceuticals in San Francisco. Thankfully, at the same time, he launched his first website, a rudimental website, but got his name out there. One of his clients from Mattercise reached out to him and asked for some training. This is when Steve realized he could train people online, um, which continues to train 50 to 60 clients online, including phone consultations. After traveling around the world, living out of one bag, teaching jujitsu seminars, mobility, movement, breath, self-defense seminars, he's now settled in Port Townsend, Washington. One of my greatest <laughs> inspirations. Ladies and gentlemen, Kaiha, Steve Maxwell, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Steve. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate you having me on the show. Hopefully, I have some good information for the folks listening out there. Absolutely. Uh, we're so excited to speak with you. And our first question, and this is so important for people to know, and if they don't know, the time to start thinking about this is now. What is your mission, Steve Maxwell? What is your mission here on this earth, on, in this reality, in this plane of existence? I thought about that many times. And there was times I actually doubted my mission, but I keep coming back to the same thing. Uh, my mission is to teach people how to, be, how to live their healthiest life. How, uh, not just physically, but emotionally and, 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 and mentally. I've had my own ups and downs, but uh, I think, I've been able to see my way clear to to being pretty good at this little game. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that that that's my main mission. Uh, I'm doing it through health, health education, and uh, so forth. Uh, exercise is a small part of that, but it's a really big, important part. Of it. It's one where most people are very confused and often get quite wrong. Excellent. So, um, Ty Ha and I have met, first met through Aubrey Marcus's Go For Your Win online course. And the main message from that course is um, by going for your win, you're doing it. This is it. You're winning. It's the process, which is important, not the destination. Our society teaches people, oh, like when you get this, you'll be happy. When you get this degree, when you get the job, when you get this relationship. 
but that's not where the nectar lies, in my opinion, in Thai Haas. It's the process. It's, it's the journey. Um, well, you so, know, I was, ra I was raised on the, the great American dream, right? You graduate high school and you go to college, you get your degree, you find that perfect woman and settle down and buy the beautiful little house with the white picket fence and two cars and two and a half kids. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that was the American dream. And, you know, I, I actually believed in that dream for a while. And then I realized it wasn't for me. It, 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 I definitely didn't fit that mold. <laughs> but not for one of trying. You know, I've been married and divorced three times. So <laughs> I, uh, it wasn't for one of trying. I finally just woke up and realized, what the heck am I doing? Why do I keep beating my head against uh, a rock? Mm -hmm. So it, well, that, that American dream wasn't for me. So what does, what does your win look like for you today? What does that mean, going for your win? What does winning for Steve Maxwell mean and look like for him today? Well, one thing, uh, wealth can be measured in many ways. Uh, I have all the time in the world. I can pretty much do what I want, when I want. I run my own schedule. I wake up every day uh, being able to spend time doing the things that are important to me and the things that I like. I am not on anyone else's schedule, other than when I agree to appear someplace or to teach a workshop or seminar or a podcast like this. But other than that, uh, I run the show. And I realized fairly early on that not too many people can say that. That's, to me, that's huge, having that kind of freedom to come and go as you want and pretty much make your own way not working for anybody else, being your own boss, and just having that, that, that time to spend doing the things that you like to do. So what are, what are those, Steve? What are your things that you like to do? What are the things that are most important to you? Well, a lot of self-care, because I plan on living to 100 if I can, <laughs> see if I can get the most out of this body. I figure I need all that time to pay off past karma and uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, have, have complete soul development in this life. So I, I might need that extra time. But uh, I spend a lot of time doing uh, uh, energetic exercises, Taoist yoga, uh, Qigong, uh, some form of uh, meditation every day. Uh, of course, I, I do some form of physical activity every single day. Not working out per se, but, you know, certainly, you know, br breathing exercises. Uh, uh, walking, uh, sometimes jogging. Uh, I still get in the mat. There's a little there. Well, before the lockdown, there was a really cool little jujitsu gym. I go in there and teach sometimes, and and still get in the mat and roll with the guys. So, yeah, these I like to spend time doing stuff I like: hiking in the woods, being in nature. You know, and I, I live in a very rural area, so it's very easy to get into nature. I mean. I have like a herd of deer in my yard every morning. One one of the does just gave birth to a baby fawn. Cutest little <laughs> thing. So that that's really cool, right? Absolutely. All my little anim, all animal friends running around. So it's, I want to be. It's, yeah, um, I, I want to become you, Steve Maxwell, when I grow up. <laughs> I'm in the process uh, now. Well, you know, for for almost fifteen years, I was a nomad. I, I had no home. I lived in Airbnbs and hotels all over the world and no, no uh, base of operations, just going from country to country. And I mean, literally all over the world, uh, China, Russia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, all over Scandinavia, Iceland, you know, Denmark, Norway, Finland. I mean, really all over uh, Canada <laughs> a few times, uh, Mexico uh, a few times. Uh, before I was in South America and Brazil a bunch of times, but that, uh, that was before my nomad, nomadic thing. But yeah, just a different place all the time. All, almost every country in the uh, uh, Baltic region and the Balkan region. So mm -hmm. I, I had a chance to really look around and see what's going on out of there. And I finally decided to pull off the road as the insistence insistence of my one of my spiritual mentors this is robert koch 
he is an astrologer. He's the guy that Joe Rogan gave me so much grief about <laughs> in, in, in the, the one podcast. And Robert Koch has been like a spiritual mentor, uh, a philosopher, and he's an older guy. I've never seen him. He's very secretive about the way, where he lives and where, where, where he looks and everything. But he's been right on. And he told me a year ago about this epidemic. Wow. He warned me, get off the road in 2020, find a place, probably be best to go back to the U.S., your home country, and stay there. And so Teresa and I bought a tiny house. And um, it's made in Idaho. We bought it used in uh, Spokane, Washington. And we had a guy from Sonny's RV just down the road haul it all the way to Port Townsend. So I live in the space. Uh, it's, I guess it's about 22 feet by eight and a half feet. But it has everything I need. In fact, you can see, let's see. Can you see that? That's the back yeah. of the tiny house. That's my wardrobe and my closet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have everything. I have all, everything you need for uh, a kitchen, full-size fridge, and then that's where I sleep. There's like a, a little, a little stairwell. That, and you can see a little sleeping area up there. Wow. Our own personal so, tour. So cute. So, so it's a really cute little house. And I have uh, stumps, like wooden cedar stumps for stairs. Outside, it looks like a little hobbit house. <laughs> and I'm very happy here. And uh, Teresa, she stays with me sometimes, but she stays a lot in the big house too. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you're explaining all of this because right before we just talked about how you traveled all over the world lived the nomad life now you live in this tiny house and if, i don't know how many years ago but you were believing in that and chasing that american dream traditional life right and this is pretty much the complete opposite of what that um would be and i i'm just thinking about i I'm a lot younger than both of you guys, but I still, and people that are my age and younger than me are still following that traditional career model. And I lasted, I studied mechanical engineering in school and I lasted one year in that field before I realized I cannot sit inside behind a cubicle all day for the rest of my life. There's no way. And you talked about how you can make your own schedule. And that's what's so awesome about personal training. Even if you're like working in a gym, which is what I was doing before the pandemic started, you're kind of in control of your own schedule. And that's what's so awesome about it. And I, I just could not imagine living that nine to five life anymore. And it's just what I think we're, we grow up believing that we have to do that we have to go to school go to college start working for the rest of our lives all day long and have like two hours to ourselves in the afternoon but it's so important to have that time for yourself to do all of those self-care practices meditation breath work i have somehow i'm not working right now but somehow i'm like still not getting all the things i want to get done in the day because it's just there's so many things that we can be doing to take care of ourselves and make ourselves better. And that's what I've been trying to like capitalize on in this time. But if you are following somebody else's schedule, nine to five, sometimes a lot longer than that in the office, you just don't have that time. And it's just, I can't imagine doing that for long. And so many people do that. But I think in this day and age with the rise of technology, as you've so taken advantage of, you know, we have the ability to just totally change how we approach our careers now. And I think it's really important for people to start believing that they don't have to follow that traditional career model anymore and they can make their own schedule. They can do everything that they want to do. They just kind of have to have the, um, the what's it called? Like, chase the fear and jump into that discomfort and go for it, go for their win when, when it might be a little scary, not what normal people feel comfortable doing. Well, I was just having this discussion the other day. Uh, that's one of the things the pandemic did for people. Uh, it showed them there is another model. A lot of people, like when I discovered this Zoom, it's like, wow, you know. Yeah. And you're, you're talking to a guy that had no technology knowledge whatsoever. 
I didn't even have a cell phone until I was like 48. <laughs> it was just the assistance of my ex-wife. She insisted I get a, I, I never learned how to use a laptop. I'm using an iPad for my entire business. But yeah, people realize that, wow, I can stay at home. I was talking to my son who lives in Philly. Um, he, uh, he does online computer artwork. And his girlfriend also, who's uh, a brown bot in jiu-jitsu, by the way, uh, she also uh, works at home. Yeah, she's in the corporate world. And they're finding that they can do quite well just being in their own space, not having to go to a physical office anymore. Mm -hmm. But there is one thing I, I want to say. Uh, there may be some listeners that are very happy with a traditional career. Sure. Uh, you know, this type of lifestyle I had is certainly not for everyone. Uh, a lot of people are not cut out to be nomad and live a nomadic lifestyle. Uh, a lot of people enjoy uh, their nine to fives. My father was one. My dad used to, he worked for the Federal Department of Agriculture. And I can remember as a, a, a little boy, he would say, man, I love my job. I can't wait to get out of bed in the morning to go to work. That's and I was awesome. so impressed. I used to say, wow, man, that is so cool. My dad loves going to work and he loves his job. And I would hear all the other fathers grumbling, oh, my God, it's Monday. Or thank God it's Friday. Mm -hmm. But here was a man that was very happy. So when I was very young, I might have been maybe around 12, it was about the same time I started working out. I made up my mind I was going to be like my father and find something that I really, really enjoy. And the people that really I, I, I guess I felt most drawn to were my coaches, my wrestling coaches and my physical education teachers. I happen to have a really excellent uh, physical education teacher in junior high and also in high school, and they made a huge impact on me. And I decided I want to be like them. I wanted to teach health and physical education. Then I discovered later, eh, kids aren't so great. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I discovered uh, that I liked working with adults more, or at least older teenagers, a lot more than younger kids. But mm -hmm. it, was, it was a good path. It was a good experience. And from there, it was just a very short hop into the, the fitness industry, which did not exist at that time. When I uh, in the 1970s, it was just in its very fledgling state. There were gyms, but they were kind of like, you know, like dungeons, <laughs> just mm -hmm. old, old rusty barbells and stuff like that. Uh, there, there's they started doing these chain gyms where they had Women's Day and then Men's Day, and with these craptastic machines and things, uh, with you know whirlpool and there's dinky little pools at three strokes you're across that. That was a real big thing in the 70s, this type of spa-like gyms. But other than that, gyms didn't exist like you do uh, nowadays. That's so crazy for me to think about because that's just- And there was no personal training. I ever, yeah, that's not something I ever experienced. <laughs> so when, when, I, when, I, when I first realized that someone was willing to pay me good money to put them through a workout, it blew my mind because yeah. I was doing it for free, basically. Mm -hmm. you know? I ran a Nautilus- fitness center and there was this uh uh it was very popular in those days called negative only training where you would lift a weight about 40 percent greater than your positive strength like a much heavier weight mm -hmm. but usually 40 40 percent more and someone would help you get it into position and then release and then the person would do the negative portion of the rep then you'd help them get back into position and it was a very productive way of training but man, what a backbreaker for the trainer. Yeah. You know, especially the guy was strong. It was even harder with barbells. In fact, you needed two guys in some cases. And wow. it, it wasn't without being dangerous, but it was very productive. And uh, that's when I said, hey, man, if you want a negative only workout, I've got to get a little extra money here. So <laughs> I, I, was, I, I was doing these workouts, which was like a workout for me for like 10 bucks. And I thought that was good money. And this was back in the 70s. And then later, you know, things started to, I started to see the picture. One thing um, Taiha was mentioning, and that I know you're really big on it, I'd love to hear you talk about this. Our biggest enemy, Steve, is fear. 
talk to us about fear and how you have personally overcome and your advice for others on overcoming fear and also overcoming that daily resistance that Taiha also mentioned, that thing that's holding us back. Well, a lot of fear is created through the collective mindset. You, you have your subconscious mind and your conscious mind. And in the background, your conscious mind is programming the subconscious mind continuously with all sorts of random thoughts, even though you may not be aware of it. Uh, it's happening. And almost everything that a person attracts in their life, be it good or be it bad, is created through the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind directs your actions to certain set of circumstances. So if a person is predominantly thinking about all the things they don't want to have happen, they're worried about the bills. Oh my God, the kids, the children, the children. Oh, my mortgage payments do. Oh, the pandemic, the virus is going to get me. Well, these are the experiences that their subconscious mind will direct them to having. Mm -hmm. these, once you're aware that this process exists, you can program your subconscious mind to attract only the good. And through the universal law of attraction, you can attract goodness and beauty and love and not negative things like fear and doubt and hate and all these other things. So I spend a lot of time keeping the subconscious mind programmed with goodness and beauty, but it takes a lot of work. And people do this whether they're aware of it or not. Mm -hmm. Every single thing that happens is a sum total of all our positive and negative thoughts. Nothing happens by random, nothing happens by chance. There's no such thing as injustice in this world. Everything happens with the mathematical precision and happens exactly the way it does. I don't believe a person dies one second before their time. But you can create that time through negative thinking. Now, this is not to put down people or, or, or blame people, you know. Uh, sometimes people feel very defensive, like, well, you know, my grandfather had cancer. and It was no fault of his own. He was a kind, lovely man. Yes, but you never know what the person's subconscious programming is for these type of events. So fear comes in from the collective conscious. People as a group are unaware of their power to choose and their power to make their own life through the use of the universal law of attraction. If anyone would like to read about this, I highly recommend As a Man Thinketh with, by James Allen. That was my first book in mental science. And also I've read dozens and dozens of authors. Another guy is Ernest Holmes, one of my favorite guys. Uh, it's called The Science of Mind. And they describe in great, of course, everyone's heard of The Secret. Uh, the work, it was compiled uh, from the works of U.S. Anderson. One of his disciples, uh, Rhonda Byrne, uh, put together some really nice books about gratitude and so forth. I'm reading so, The Magic right now. <laughs> yeah, The Magic is a wonderful book. Uh, yeah. I've, I've read these. Uh, there were some older people like Mary Baker Reddy, uh, Florence Shin, uh, Wow. Uh, John Randolph Price. I've read all his books. Uh, Neville Goddard. The, he was uh, tremendous with the power of visualization. If you can visualize it in your mind and you can actually create the feeling that has already happened, you can produce damn near miracles in your life. So this is a roundabout way of getting back to fear. Because once you understand what fear is, you can easily subvert it. It's like doing mental judo mm -hmm. constantly. You can't keep the thoughts from going into the head, but you can decide which ones to expel. So I literally see myself in my gi, and as that negative thought comes in, I see my flipping it right out of my mind. I love that. I'm going to use that for sure. <laughs> did, you, did you ever see... Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, Kurosawa movie about the uh, about judo. I don't think no. so. Uh, something a judo saga. I think it was called a judo saga. It, um, oh dear, it's it's escaping my mind. But in the in the movie, uh, there's the young guy 
who is uh, a student of Kano, and he's accosted by some villains in uh, Japan. Uh, I forget what, I think it might have been Kyoto or something, but maybe it was Tokyo. Anyway, these guys accost him in the street. And he, it, this, it was kind of whimsical. He takes the first guy and he does this beautiful throw and throws him in this big canal. And then the second guy rushes and he does the most perfect Tomonagi. And the guy flips, whoa, and lands in the river. And he throws the three assailants in the river. And it was such a fantastic uh, uh, visual that I see myself tossing fear Negative thoughts, thoughts. <laughs> in, into the canal using the, the Judo Saga of Kurosawa. I, I, think it was called, I think it was called Suguro, a Judo Saga. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the original footage was really cut. They really chopped it up. I heard that there were so many cool scenes that they left out. They actually had all sorts of really awesome training montages and so forth. So it was, it was anyway, that's my mental Judo. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll have to check out that battle. That looks... That's yeah, I, yeah, I think it's called S-E-G-U-R-O, Seguro, a Judah Saga. You can still find that on Netflix or... I'm not sure where you can find it, actually. You might find it on YouTube, actually. YouTube has a lot of hard-to-find titles if you have, a, oh. like, a, a YouTube thing. But it's worth looking. It was a great Kurosawa movie. Unfortunately, it was just really cut and chopped up. I don't know why they edited it so heavily. Uh, I heard there was just magnificent scenes that hit the uh, editing floor and those scenes have been lost. But it's still a pretty cohesive story. And it, it does tell somewhat the, the story of Judo. And some of the uh, fight scenes are actually pretty, pretty uh, entertaining. I really got to check that out so I can picture me doing that with my negative thoughts. I really love how you brought all of that up because it, I truly believe, you know, where our attention goes, energy flows, and we just manifest our experience of this life, right? And I actually wanted to share about how I'm personally going through, working through a pretty intense back injury myself right now. Um, it started in 2017. I fixed it. I kind of injured a different spot around that same area in my low back. Um, and it's been chronic for the past like seven months now. And I, as I'm sure you two are familiar with, at least some people deal with after all the weight cutting and everything through wrestling, judo, whatever you're doing, I've dealt with eating disorders and body dysmorphia for a long time, which, um, you know, I deal with a lot of negative self-talk. And after, since I started dealing with that when I was 15, I'm 24 now, nine years of speaking like that to myself the energy has to go somewhere, right? And I really believe like the randomness of my injury and when the pain shows itself and everything, like I know it's emotionally deep rooted and it, the energy is like manifested in my body. And the more that I'm practicing this kind of releasing those thoughts that don't serve me as soon as possible, especially in this quarantine time, I've had so much time to work on it. It has gotten so much better compared to before when I was stressed out and everything, but it's pretty crazy how those, like I can feel the, my mental, like my mental being is creating that physical reality for myself. And that's just how powerful our thoughts can really be. It's, it's something that we were never taught, you know, like we were taught that things just are the way that they are in science and like the t typical or, or they happen by accident yeah exactly yeah. um and i was of just course, unlucky yeah and of course like i was over training and over i was doing jujitsu every day like pring at the gym every day and i want to um hear what you have to say because i know you have learned a lot about you know not going for so much weight all the time and all of that but um i've had to learn the hard way but I know that it all goes together and I literally created this problem for myself. But what's awesome about it is I can, that means I can fix it too. So I'm going to use that. that this, this judo <laughs> uh, <laughs> first of all, let's analyze fear. It's an acronym, you know, uh, it's a future events that aren't real. Oh, wow. That is a good one. Future events aren't real so we we have this this idea this fearful thought but it doesn't it's not real not really you know i mean sometimes it's wise to be fearful you know 
obviously, mm -hmm. if I was confronted by a, uh, you know, a saber tooth tiger, you know, I'd probably have some fear. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it, it, it's good. But most of the time we're, we're afraid of things that aren't, don't even exist through worry and so forth. And that worry can compound itself in the physical body. There's a wonderful woman by the name of Louise Hay who wrote yeah, a book mm -hmm. called Who's the Matter with Me? And in the book, she goes how negative emotions can fixate themselves in different parts of the body and that different parts of the body are metaphors for what's going on in one's life. For example, I manifested some shoulder issues. That's feeling overburdened with responsibility mm -hmm. or taking up too much responsibility. Or you, you hear these terms, shoulder to the grindstone. Or, you know, shoulder your responsibility. But people literally do those things and end up with manifesting pain and uh, discomfort. Uh, I, I've had my share of injuries. Believe me, I had sciatica. I had a spondylolisthesis mm -hmm. where the L4 was forward and turned and chilled it. And I was told I'd never play sport again. And uh, in fact, my rolfer who discovered this, uh, she was afraid that I could be paralyzed from the waist down. She was really wow. scared. And I was in horrible pain, horrible pain. You know, and I looked at L4. What does it represent in the subconscious mind? Oh, it's the subconscious mind telling me uh, I was having, uh, I was feeling unsupported, uh, unloved. And I was also, uh, I didn't feel like I had creative self-expression. And mm -hmm. that pain settled in there. And I treated it holistically. I went to a acupuncture guy in Chinatown who would get me out of the immediate pain. I went to my rolfer and a really good chiropractor. The chiropractor put me in traction and the rolfer worked with the soft tissue. And eventually between the three of them, oh, and I, I also got one of those uh, back chairs that kind of uh, stretches the spine. You sit in it and you're held by your rib cage and you let the sling go and your, your lower body is just kind of hanging. And I would Ooh. sit there and watch TV. Between the back chair, the rolfer, the chiropractor and the acupuncture guy, in about three months, it finally cleared. But wow. to tell the God's honest truth, I actually went through my mind, wow, I don't want to live like this. I mean, it's the first time the word suicide even came close to my lips. Wow. I mean, I was in such agony. I could not find a comfortable position. There's a chronic burning sensation down my leg. And interestingly enough, you know, the way the sciatic runs the whole way down your feet, mm -hmm. I was having my big toe would not stop burning the toe was killing me. It. it just wouldn't stop this awful burning sensation and numbness and burning. But eventually, one day I got out of bed and it was gone as mysteriously as it came. Wow. It was just, whoa, it, it was just gone. Uh, the event that precipitated it, I was watching uh, uh, Kung Fu Theater <laughs> on Saturday and watching the great Jackie Chan doing ab rollouts with an abdominal <laughs> <laughs> I, remember, I remember that scene. Jackie Chan. And he was like an inchworm, you know. He was like, whoop, 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 whoop. I says, I can do that. And you know, that's no small feat of strength to do rollout from your feet, especially the whole leg. But I went too deep into fatigue and I left my lower back kink. Mm. And I felt something just kind of like a little click. It didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. But later that night, about three hours later, I started getting this warm feeling in the groin that started wrapping its way into my lower back. And then I got this awful radiating pain and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So that's an example that when I looked at the emotions, I created that whole scenario. First of all, being, in, being a big ego and just hopping up and doing a Jackie Chan move. Who the hell did I think I was? I was already in my close to 50 years old when I did that. <laughs> Stupid, you know, in my late forties. <laughs> Should have known better. I did this. And, <laughs> you know, and, and I was relatively unhappy in my marriage. And I was feeling kind of stymied at work. You know, uh, I would come home in the afternoon. Even though I had my dream gym exercise and a jiu-jitsu school, i come home in the afternoon thinking, damn, I wish I was back at work. And then when it would be at work, 
I kept thinking, man, I just want to go home. Mm-hmm. It was, yeah, it was like a very trying time. And I wasn't finding satisfaction or creative self-expression in what I was doing at that time. I, I, I think I was overburdened, definitely overtraining, doing some questionable exercises and so forth. And it just manifested as, as, as that. I've had other injuries, but for sure, you can set up a whole cascade of negative stress hormones and chemicals in your body to create all sorts of illness and dis-ease. Think about disease. It's dis-ease within yourself. And emotions have a huge impact on bodily health. And a lot of the things that people just take for granted as just being normal or it's just what happens, we create these things in our mind. And you can uncreate them. You can reverse the process. You can absolutely. By the way, from a mechanical point of view, go check out the work of Robin McKenzie for your lower back. Robin uh, McKenzie. Yeah. Uh, back pain <laughs> specialist. Uh, he, he's a back pain specialist. That, uh, he found that by putting people into extension, uh, extending your spine, it is incredibly pain relieving. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Steve, we mentioned um, your your ex wife and your current partner. So, from DC Maxwell and uh, in the past, and to Teresa and then now, what have you learned uh, on your relationship journey? What are, what's some relationship advice and tips you've learned on your path? Don't get married. <laughs> have an unmarried. <laughs> Teresa and I have an unmarried. What's an unmarried? Well, first of all. I don't need government interference in my personal relationship. I do not need the government's permission to cohabitate with someone. I don't even need the permission to have children if I I wanted to, but I think there's enough people in this world as it is. So, yeah, and I'm past that age now. But uh, you don't need, and even more important, if you decide that you don't want to be together, you don't need the government's permission to go your separate ways but you still have an agreement you make a pact with one another and for example i have my money i have my credit cards i can spend and do as i choose with my own finances she has her finances she has her own credit card she can spend and do as she pleases with her money we don't try to control each other we don't tell each other what to do we do come together to make big decisions like buying this tiny house for example we both finance this, uh, you know, so we'll come together for big decisions. If in an un- unmarried you were to have children, you would immediately decide who would have the children should you decide to go your separate ways. You would make an agreement before the, cat, the child was even born. Who would get, usually the mother is best suited to take care of small children, not always, but usually. But you, you have to make that agreement amongst yourself. And you would have to decide what's mine, what's yours. Already have an agreement. Sounds maybe a little cold, but there's nothing left to question. You know, there's none of this pretending kind of stuff. You put everything, all your cards on the table. And you stay together because you want to be together. And if you want to be with someone else, it's probably a good chance you're not with the right person in the first place. If you want to go and have relations with someone else, be it sexual or whatever, you're probably not with the right person. Because when you're with the right person, you want to be with them. That's what I discovered. And, you know, I kept thinking that, you know, people get married, that's what they do. But I wasn't very good at it. It was kind of hard to live with, actually. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. The unmarriage. So, you, you, um, it's basically, uh, a marriage, but one of your own creation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We we also talked about um, children and you working with schools, and that's what I do. I've taken my principles. I've learned a lot from you, Steve, and I brought that into school. And I go. My mission is to empower um, children with understanding of what choice means. I awaken their awareness and understanding of choice, and we bring that to them by awareness of their breath. So sympathetic versus parasympathetic then to the power of posture, so open posture versus closed posture. Then we take it to their vibration, so the power of a smile, choosing your, a positive mindset or being unaware. 
that's a choice. And then the last week we go over the power of now. So the choice to be present or caught up in the past, caught up in the future. And then the overriding theme there is the most uh, powerful of our, and the last of our human freedoms, choice. So that's how I serve today as I work with children, schools, and families teaching um, those lessons that I've learned from you, paying it forth. So I'd like to hear your advice um, for me on that initiative and working with kids, working with families, because it's a lot, to, why I'm wanting to work with kids is because teaching someone this at age 30, 40, 50, they have all these years of negative reps, whereas the kids that I work with, grades three, four, five, they're fresh, they're receptive, their brains are pliable. So I'd love for you just to go off and give me all the advice you have on working with kids and helping create a change for our future. I have worked with kids in the past and I, I was pretty good at it because I'm kind of like a big kid myself. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I still like to play and I, I can still get in the childlike mindset. I think it's really important to have a strong inner child and never, uh, never lose that inner child. I make plenty of time to play and have a really good time. And everyone has like a male, female aspect. It's really important to relate to people, kids or significant others uh with either your boy or your girl you know everyone has the inner boy everyone has that inner girl very important not to lose that and be aware that you have a dualistic thing going on you know and with kids i i to tell the god's honest truth uh i probably messed up with my own kids a little bit i, I probably could have done a little bit better job there uh, I think I think we had a really good time and I was a really good dad, but I I I just I just wasn't into school. I just thought it was just such a waste for the kid. I always believe the cream rises. This whole idea of herding them into like a college education, you know, forcing kids that just don't like academics to try to be an academic, to get a career and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I really didn't put any pressure. That was one of the problems with my ex-wife and I. You know, she she was very much into education, and she wanted you know to push the kids towards college and all that. And I did it. And neither kid, uh, well, actually, my daughter, who's uh, 28, is actually in college now, go, uh, getting a degree in um, psychology. But Zach, he went the art route and entered art school, and ended up doing exactly what he wanted to do. Had he gone to college, that probably would have never happened. But uh, yeah, I may not be the best person to ask about kids. You know, I really commend uh, you uh, for working with children, but uh, I, I don't think I am the kind of person to ask th that particular question. I, I just don't think that, uh, you know, my kids grew up pretty good. They're pretty strong and healthy. They're, they're not sickly at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so but, we'll Tell us something that you are proud of. You've had so many accomplishments. So let's celebrate some of your biggest wins, your biggest celebrations, your biggest successes so far. And what is it that you're most proud of thus far? Well, it, it was an amazing day when Zach was born, my, my, my eldest son. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget that day. That was pretty intense. <laughs> it was a real spiritual. I was there for the birth. Uh, unfortunately, uh, DC had to have a C-section and uh, it was pretty painful for her but I was the first person to hold him and the first person to actually make eye contact so we always had this bond and that was pretty he heavy duty and uh, I've talked to my astrologer about this and it was uh, we, we had a, like a, a real tight spiritual connection you know it's uh, who, who comes into your life it, it's basically based on karma past karmic debt whether it's a debt to be paid you to them, them to you, or sometimes it's just a, a really good attraction. Uh, you know, two, two people that knew each other in, in another alternative universe or whatever reality coming together again to be with each other. And that's what it was like for me was that. And then uh, the year that he won the world, the IFBJJ world, that was pretty amazing, man. That was like, wow, because I was really into it. Unfortunately, um, I think he burned out on it a little bit. He, he pretty much just had it with jujitsu. But uh, that was a very proud day for me. That was awesome. like, 
really amazing to see this little boy that I took and used to have him wrestle a teddy bear right up there with the world's elite jiu-jitsu guys and actually win a world title. That was pretty far out. Awesome. And I just wanted to uh, uh, thank you for your vulnerability. And there's no handbook for being a parent. I don't know how that would go for me. So, um, you know, you just do the best that you can and learn what worked, what didn't. And that's all you can really do. And, and he, he, he followed in his dad's footsteps, learning that, you know, I don't have to go to college if I don't like, that's not my thing. You know, I think that's really awesome that you're kind of able to show him that it's more important to do what you love than, than to listen to what other people tell you to do. And it was even the same with jujitsu because I kind of pushed him into it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, he was training <clears throat> from the time he was just a really little boy right up through to his uh, 20s. Wow. And he just decided, you know what? Mm, I just don't care about this that much anymore. I, I just don't want to do what I have to do to compete at the world level. And he just got really disillusioned with the whole scene and just decided, you know what? I'm just going to drop this. And at first I was a little, uh, little upset, but I realized that was just my fucked upness, you know, <laughs> it wasn't him. And, you know, maybe I did him a disservice by pushing him in there. I don't know. But, you know, once again, nothing happens to us by accident. So, you know, maybe he was supposed to go through, he, he obviously he was supposed to go through that experience. And then he developed consciousness to reject it. He didn't feel like he had to stay there just because his parents, you know, crafted this trail, this path yeah. for him. He decided yeah. to reject it. And I 100% I accepted it. It's fine. It's, yeah. it's, it's good. I'm, I'm glad that he found his own way and that he's finding something fulfilling and that he actually enjoys it. So that, that's, that's kind of cool. Awesome. But, you yeah. As, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, um, you've mentioned many of your helpers along the way, um, Robert Gotts, um, and many other helpers. Um, who, how do you be a good helper yourself? What's your advice on how to be a good helper yourself and how to be a good mentor to others? Uh, just, just listen to people and just be there for them. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of listening to someone. You know, I'm not real big on just letting people unload a whole raft of negativity. I prefer to stay clear of, of folks like that that are constantly ranting and, you know, bemoaning their fate and this and that and the other thing. But sometimes it really does help to let someone pour their heart out and to really listen and just not offer advice right away. Let them just kind of just tell you exactly what's on their mind. I'm not a psychologist or a scientist or anything like that, but I, I think I've really enabled people to to uh, work through problems in their in, in their time. And of course, one way I help people is I make them feel better about themselves through proper exercise. the The number one mood elevator is exercise. And interestingly enough, of all the things you can do, proper strength training is the greatest mood elevator makes people feel really good about themselves. It's really hard to be in a bad mood when you're exercising properly. And so I'm able to really help people a lot through showing them safe, sane, sensible workout program. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I mean, I knew at 12 years old that that's what I wanted to do. I didn't know how it was going to manifest. I couldn't imagine owning a gym or later personal training but I started the only way I knew, and that was to be a physical education teacher. But it was just a short hop, skip, and jump to the fitness industry, and another short hop to be an independent personal trainer and contractor, another short hop to doing workshops and seminars. So that was my path. But it was always basically the same thing, health and fitness and, you know, bu building building your your body and your fitness level and that helps people a lot mm -hmm. i um i wanted to touch on what you said about listening to people because this is something that i think everybody can work on most of us listen to respond you know before somebody's even done talking we are ready to say something 
or we're trying to fix what they're trying to say. And a lot of the time people just need space to be held for them. And, and when you are, you know, already trying to say something before the person's finished, you're not listening to them anymore. And I feel like people can truly feel that. And so then it's a lot harder for them to, you know, receive the help that you are trying to provide them. So um, I just think the listening is such an important skill that we all can work on a little bit more. One of my goals is to, for these podcasts who I wrote down earlier, like be so engrossed in the conversation that it takes me like a minute to even process afterwards to figure out what I want to say. But um, it's something that I'm working on and I, I think we all can, can work on too. I, uh, one of the things that made a big impression, I, I read Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. Mm-hmm. In fact, I read all his books and listened to every one of his videotapes. This is when I was living as a nomad in my uh, camper van. And uh, one of the things was the way that you listen is to literally hang on every single word, make eye contact, keep that eye contact, and literally listen to the sound and the tone and the tenor of the words and truly listen. I, 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 I haven't always done that in my life, but I noticed that when I really started concentrating on what people are really saying, uh, it's much more meaningful and they feel that they can feel that support and that, that energy. And you literally get a much better communication mm-hmm. as opposed to let your thoughts race and already thinking of the next step or the thing you're going to say while they're still saying it. And, Way better just to be here, be now, listen to what they're saying. Totally. It works. Mm-hmm. It's, it, you get a much better, a higher level of communication. And yeah. people appreciate that. Sometimes they just need to be heard. Mm-hmm. Once again, that doesn't mean that we should allow ourselves to become doormats and people just dump on us. Right. People like that, you know, you learn to avoid. But then you have to ask yourself, what? kind of energy am i putting out to attract that kind of person in the <laughs> first place yeah every morning as soon as i open my eyes i say today is the first day of the rest of my life mm. only only good comes to me only good comes from me today i will meet those that need me most and i will meet those that i need most and we will be inexplicably drawn together oh so beautiful yeah. So when, so I'm constantly meeting amazing people that help me along my life path, but I like to be there for the people that need me most. Also, it's an energy thing, mm-hmm. and it's all about the kind of energy you put out. So I work on my aura, my inner light. There was another one that Joe Rogan had a problem with. He wanted, <laughs> to, debunk, he wanted to debunk the idea that there's this energetic body or an, an, an aura, you know. <laughs> Last, I stuck with I stuck with you, Steve, and um, you, you sell some really great videos on your website. I've I've purchased I think all of them except for the kettlebells. You've you've got me off of kettlebells, um, and one of those videos. Well, it, it is it's not that the kettlebells don't work. They absolutely work. The problem with kettlebells is the the, uh, the stress and strain of the joints over time. It, it really does degrade the joint with the fast ballistic movement. Uh, the snatch in particular is uh, pretty pretty harmful. Uh, jerking a weight overhead, you know, that type of thing. Even the swings begin to degrade the back over time. It's no accident that many of the original people in the RKC and many of the people in Strong First have had multiple surgeries, hip replacements, uh, knee surgeries, shoulders, elbows. I was seeing this more and more. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. You can definitely build strength and muscle and increase endurance. The problem is, is the stress and strain on the musculoskeletal system and the insult to the joints. And it does degrade the joints over time. Is there, you can do the same thing much safer. Mm-hmm. I, I, um, I've learned so much in the past since this back injury kind of has been really mentally and physically debilitating because I was lifting super heavy, going to jujitsu all the time. And then out of nowhere, it was just like constantly there. And then I fell snowboarding and it made it worse. So I've learned so much about 
you know, I think the wrestler mentality is a real thing. And I was just so pushing Dan, myself, pushing Dan, myself. Dan Gable syndrome. Yep. Like do as much as you can until you can't anymore. And I've just learned how, you know, I don't need to be squatting. I'm 105 something pounds like that. And I was PRing on 165 back squats. Like I don't need to be lifting that much. I can get the same results as I know that you've been teaching like lower weight, slower reps. Like you don't, it's, it's this ego thing that I've been dealing with for a long time. Lots of people deal with that one, push a lot of weight. And, and I've just learned so much and I'm 24. Like I should not have a back injury wrestling judo all of that stuff obviously was really hard on my body so i'm not surprised but i want to be doing this until i'm 102 so i need to start being way smarter i've been when i was in the gym before um quarantine i i was doing like 65 pound squats but paying attention to them and it was still really hard so i've just learned a lot about that so i i love that you kind of teach that because i don't think most trainers kind of teach that there's a big difference between resistance and weight they're not mm -hmm. the same thing uh, a heavy weight can actually if it's lifted with uh using leverage and speed can actually be rather relatively low resistance mm -hmm. you know like power lifters yeah the only people that should be concerned with the amount of weight are competitive lifters power lifters olympic weight lifters uh, maybe crossfitters they compete, but for us athletes, especially combat athletes, the amount of weight is beside the point. A clever person can learn to use a lightweight, which is way less stressful on the joints, and make it super hard. Mm -hmm. In other words, even with just your body weight. I, I, I ran a seminar for a cadre of trainers, uh, actually uh, from the Cincinnati Reds baseball team, and this one guy was very skeptical that a bodyweight squat could be hard enough for him because he, he was doing sets and reps with close to 600 pounds. And this is a very strong, very strong guy. Yeah. And I, I dropped him in less than 90 seconds using what we call short lever, super slow squats. Mm. I had him stand in front of a, uh, a wall. So he couldn't lean forward. He couldn't unload. And uh, I made him start at the bottom and very slowly come up in about 10 seconds, just a little above parallel, not locking the knees, and then very slowly return back down, but not unloading at the bottom, not resting his hamstrings on his calves, keeping tight. Within about 90 seconds, his legs were gone. He was absolutely shocked. He fell over backwards on the floor, and he was like, holy God. But see, that's an example of using leverage to make the exercise harder. Whereas most weightlifters and powerlifters or people that are looking to lift heavy weight, they use leverage to their advantage, oftentimes uh, cutting the range of motion short, uh, only working the top strong range of motion, uh, using momentum, speed, uh, locking out the knees and resting between reps because they mistakenly believe that the weight is the most important thing, mm -hmm. but it is not. So a person could really use very little weight or even no weight, just the body, if they know how to manipulate leverage. And you can make the resistance really hard. And what that translates directly into every other sport. You're still building strength. You know, your muscles are still working as hard as they possibly can. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, it's easy. Uh, it, it's actually harder in some ways using the lighter weight. But that strength is directly transferable. There's a lot of lifts, like power cleans, Olympic barbell snatches and things. Um, none of the skills involved with throwing a bar around translate into anything else. Yeah. They don't. Uh, they're a thing unto itself. It's a skill unto itself. So the strength transfers, but even though you get strong doing those things, it's not the best way to get strong. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's it's so interesting to think about the concept of like fast versus slow too, because I think a lot of people don't feel like they're getting the same workout or as good a workout if they're going slowly and mentally it's hard for them to think that they're accomplishing as much. And it's the whole like 
society that we've been, you know, you got to do so much and go so fast when really it's slowing down that allows you to be present, allows you to stay aware, not only in working out, but in the rest of your life. Like, what are you trying to accomplish now? If you're rushing through something, how good are you going to do it? Right. And, and how safe is that going to be is if you're working out? And that's something that I, I learned so well through both of these injuries. <laughs> like it is not about going fast. It is not about the weight. It's about paying attention to really positioning yourself in the safest, stablest position and maintaining that and not cheating yourself. Cause our body loves to cheat ourselves you know you squat down your knees cave in a little bit it's so much harder if you continue to drive them out just grip the ground with your feet rather than just letting them be there you know and and it's just something that we were never really taught about is to be aware of our entire body as we're doing things you know people do a squat and all they're thinking about is their legs when you can make it an entire body exercise if you're engaging your core engaging your upper body while you hold it and everything like that so i think just showing people that it's okay and even better for you to slow down is, is important. Well, one of the reasons why people think they need to move fast, there's this, there's this mistaken idea that if you move explosively or fast, you're selectively recruiting fast twitch muscle fiber. Mm. That's been proven to be patently false. There's absolutely no truth to that. You develop, you, you, you recruit just as many fast twitch muscle fibers going really slow or even isometrically oh wow when i was in russia uh i i involved myself with a russian martial art called systema and uh all the russian systema guys were doing these really slow slow body weight calisthenics really slow like you know 20 30 seconds for a one just to do the positive part of a rep try that sometime Woo. <laughs> and or or just holding isometric uh yielding isometric uh positions no movement at all but believe me you get your, your cardiovascular system your heart uh, all every muscle fiber slow through fast is getting a thorough workout you don't need to move at different rep speeds or different use different loads you know it used to be heavy weight low reps for fast twitch muscle fiber and for mm -hmm. strength medium weight medium reps for hypertrophy light weight high reps for endurance that's been all proven to be completely false it all built strength across the board some mm -hmm. more efficiently than others some people do better with a higher time under limb some people do a little bit better with a lower uh, that's only through experimentation but in truth it doesn't matter heavy weight light weight medium weight high reps medium low reps you're going to get to the same place genetically it's just the wear and tear on the body. So that's something that people should be really aware of. And they should look when they do their training to preserve their youth and their joints. Because believe me, I didn't always follow this advice. I've had plenty of injuries. And, you know, in my exercise philosophy, I believe that exercise should prevent injuries, not cause. So if people are getting hurt, doing exercise they need to take a hard look of what they're doing and why now in sport it's different there's no way you can do wrestling or judo or mma or jujitsu you know football whatever any contact sport without suffering an injury you're going to get hurt yeah. i mean come on it's the nature of the game yeah. but we walk we walk into those sports knowing full well that's the possibility and we accept that but no one should go into the gym and expect to get hurt <laughs> unless they're a power lifter or, unless that is their sport if they're a strong man competitor for example you know and anyone see the uh the mountain uh, deadlift the 1100 pounds wow no. it was on uh yeah it was on the social media uh the 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 mountain uh i forget his name in that gym in iceland yeah deadlifted 1,100 pounds. Now, it wasn't a true deadlift. You're, you're a powerlifting purist because he used straps. He used a lifting strap for his grip. But still, being able to haul over 1,000 pounds off the floor, whoo, that's a pretty mighty, that's a mighty man. That is a, that is a mighty man. And Steve Maxwell, you are a mighty man. 
what is the greatest lesson you learned <laughs> on the path of life? Mighty Mouse. <laughs> what is your greatest lesson you've ever you've learned thus far on the path that you'd like to tell Taiha and myself and our audience? Your greatest wisdom. The power. The the power. The power of the spoken word. Words are energetic things. When you speak the word, the power of the word, you put into action. You actually create a vibratory pattern that will come back to you. If you're putting out negative words, if you're cursing, using foul language, you're insulting people or whatever, using expletives, you're going to, whatever energy you send out, you're going to get back. So one of the most important lessons I ever learned was say what you mean, mean what you say, watch what you say. Measure your words carefully. Mean, say what you mean, mean what you say, and watch what you say. And if you do that, your life is going to immediately improve for the, for, the, for the better. Because now you're controlling what's coming out of the mouth. You know? Mm -hmm. and you, there, you is a, there is a biblical verse. You know, all the ancient prophets knew about this stuff, including uh, Jesus Christ. He mentioned it's not what a man putteth into his mouth that defileth him, but what cometh out. Mm -hmm. Remember the 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 uh, the the uh, scribes and Pharisees were trying to trick him because he wasn't following the uh, the kosher protocols of the the Jews, and uh, that's when he retorted back to these guys. Yeah, it's it's not what you put into your mouth; it's what comes out. What he meant was the power of the spoken word. It was a metaphor. It was a biblical metaphor for, yeah, watch what you're saying, man. That, that, that will create much more havoc in your life than anything that you eat as far as food substance and so forth. Totally. Cursing and swearing at somebody is 10 times worse than eating a pack of Twinkies. <laughs> and it's just like what we were talking about. Our, our thoughts create our reality, really. And when you are declaring your thoughts out loud, you're sending that into the universe. So what kind of, what kind of reality do you want to create for yourself? There's nothing more powerful than what we declare is happening for our own experience, right? So and awesome. af affirmations, man. That is, uh, I'm huge in affirmations. For every, listen, you can't help but think negative thoughts. They go in your mind, you know, they don't come from within yourself either. Sometimes they're coming from the outside. You know, you pick up other people's thoughts. I'm sure you've had the experience of, you know, thinking something at the same time with somebody. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, that happens. The, the mind is very powerful. You can pick up the vibrations of other people. So when you do get negative thoughts or fears, you got to affirm it away. So I usually say two or three aff positive affirmations for every negative. One of my favorites is, uh, may I be under grace and not under law, meaning that I recognize the error of what I just said, and I'm asking to be under grace, meaning forgiven, to be exempt, and not under the law of karma, not under karmic mm -hmm. law for some misstatement. So may I be under grace and not under law. Or because I grew up a Christian, so I like Christian metaphors. And I like Christian wording, but you could be a Muslim, you could be a Jew, you could be a Zoroastrian, you could be a Buddhist, it doesn't matter. The same principles apply. Religion has nothing to do with it. The same basic spiritual premise is underlying all of these things. Sometimes people that get hung up in religion are missing the whole point in the first place. Mm -hmm. But I do, I do say things like, uh, I, I cast this upon the Christ within so I may get free. Another favorite when I get, you know, talk, we were talking about fear, right? Mm -hmm. My favorite is, yeah, remember as a child watching cartoons, the old Warner Brothers cartoons, and there, there's a common cartoon that happens. It's like the mouse or, or the, the person is watching this big, scary shadow coming around the corner, and it looks like this big lion, scary. And then when he looks, it's a little meow, a little pussycat, right? Yeah. We've all seen a cartoon like that. So my affirmation is I face the lion of fear and turn it into a pussycat. <laughs> I love that. That's beautiful. So 
the fear is like this big scary line. Oh God, the scary shadow. Woo! It's really getting me upset. And then when I really face it, it's just a little pussycat. It's nothing. So sometimes like you dread having a conversation with somebody or facing someone on something they've been doing that you don't like, or maybe a boss or an employer or a significant other, whatever. And you are just dreading this conversation and you're working yourself up and you maybe even start to imagine a false conversation of what you're going to, what they're going to say and what you're going to say. It's like you're already creating a negative situation. That's when I face the line of fear and ch turn it into a pussycat and you march right in as fearless as Daniel in the lion's den. And you look the person in the eye and you say your piece, and 99% of the time when I do that, all is good. The energy is perfect. Sometimes a person will freely accept what I have to say. Sometimes they're a little reluctant, but it, it always works out. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's many dozens of situations where you can face the line of fear. And you prime this with your morning routine. You, you're, you're telling us earlier um, this power of thought begins the first thought moment you wake up and you say those words. So could you get into what that, what that looks like after, after those words, what your morning routine looks like? Um, and also very important to the morning routine is your nighttime routine, how you prepare for sleep, because how you prepare, how you unwind your evening sets you up for a good next day. So maybe um, can we hear a bit, a bit about that as we move towards the end of this interview? I, I have certain uh, prayers and or uh, affirmations I'll make uh, right at that, there's a twilight between sleep and wakefulness. As you wake up in the morning, there's that slight time where you're still not quite awake, but you're not asleep. Also, as you're drifting off to sleep, that's the best time to program your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. You can use visualization and see what it is that you want to accomplish. You literally clearly see it in your mind's eye. Like I pictured living in a tiny house for a long time. And uh, I, it's not just visualizing it. You got to create the emotional joy and feelings within yourself that it already exists because in time, everything already exists. Everything, all knowledge. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's ever happened or ever will happen already is now. It just, in energy form. So you got to, through the law of attraction, your subconscious mind is like an order, ordering center. You put out your order to the big spiritual Amazon, and then you get your delivery. <laughs> and you can, you, 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 can, you can work with that, you know? So usually I'll, I'll have like a little prayer affirmations in the morning. And then I go about doing, you know, I do like head massage, eye exercises, ear tapping, uh, swishing the tongue, uh, I, you know, finger massages, ankle. I massage my turn organs with my fingers. Uh, I do genital massage, really good for testosterone. Uh, actually, massaging the testicles and the penis uh, in a way is called the deer exercise. It's all part of uh, Iron Shirt Qigong and, mm. and uh, Taoist yoga. You can keep your body very youthful. It, it's... Uh, you don't stimulate yourself. It's not masturbation. It's just like, you know, I tap my kidneys. I, I massage my thyroid. You know, all those glands. Very important to keep them youthful and young. Then I'll get up and I have, you know, like a whole routine. Tongue scraping, neti pot, uh, electric toothbrush, uh, ice cold shower every morning, even in winter. It's cold as it comes. Do breathing be, to prepare myself for it. And then uh, a, a whole drying ritual with a, a coarse towel. Then I'll do tapping and, and waist twisters, a whole little routine. And then I'm ready to start my day, get dressed, uh, you know, usually water. Uh, I like my favorite drink uh, in the morning is cold brew coffee with coconut water. Coffee and coconut water. Ah, it's so delicious. It's just a little bit. It gives you energy, you know, because usually I like to go out and walk and do some breathing exercises or whatever. Uh, sometimes I'll get online, do uh, a couple of online clients, do a couple of programs. But I always try to get out early. 
And this is all before my first meal. So the only, the only calories I get is that coconut water. Really nice. Uh, I'll, I'll take herbal supplements at different times, depending on what's going on with me. Uh, I, I've been really careful uh, taking uh, uh, immune boosters uh, during this whole virus thing. I didn't have any real fear of the virus, but uh, you know, no one wants to get sick. So I just took a little extra precaution. And then I'll go out and take a walk or a jog during breathing exercises. A uh, couple of days a week, I'll do uh, strength training. I'll come back. Uh, when the gym was open, I would go in uh, usually about one o'clock and do a roll with the guys. A couple people I like to train with. At 67, I gotta be careful. So I, I pick people that are smooth and relaxed and, and have good technique. The better the technician, the more fun. Uh, I can handle the young, young, crazy, herky jerky guys, but it's just not fun, you know. Plus, there's always that chance of getting hurt. It's just not worth it, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I'll come back and work them online. Have my first meal of the day, and then uh, usually at night, I like to watch shows. I like uh, you're gonna laugh. I like Korean drama. <laughs> Korean. I like I like K drama. I am so into it, man. I just got done watching Crash Landing on You. And I'm watching Mr. Sunshine right now about a Korean American that goes back to Joseon. This is like in the uh, early 1900s, and he falls in love with a Korean noble woman. And you know, I, I, I like that whole K drama thing. I like Asian uh, uh, movies. I like foreign movies. I, I watch German and Russian movies. Uh, I, I watch American too, but I, I like to watch these real light, happy. Yeah, you know, that has like Edgar Tolle said something that has space in it. You know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'll watch things like Better Call Saul, or you know, I like to watch a show or two. Cool. And then, uh, then it's bedtime. I'll go upstairs, and as I'm drifting off to sleep, uh, once again, I'll do a prayer or affirmation, you know. And uh, boom, that's it. I, I like to take melatonin. Uh, at 67, uh, I don't feel it hurts me. I've read a lot of really good things about it. Uh, it really boosts the immune system. Uh, a lot of people were saying that children and young people weren't getting uh, sick with the virus because melatonin levels are way higher in kids than older people. Older people with uh, uh, low, low melatonin levels seem to be more susceptible. That was one of the theories. But it's easy enough to take care of. Just pop a five milligram sublingual tablet. Uh, I also put tape over my mouth at night. I tape my mouth shut. Really good Whoa. for... Uh, it, ensuring uh, nasal breathing. Uh, I would recommend all your listeners read The Oxygen Advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on based list. on the Boot Yego. Uh, Boot Yego was a, uh, a breathing therapist in Russia. Uh, one of his disciples wrote the book, The Oxygen Advantage, uh, Patrick McEwen, and uh, really good information in there. And one of the things they suggest is to wear tape, very good for the uh, dental health, and very good for for uh, breath work at night because it is easy to get a stuffy nose and start to mouth breathe, which could lead to snoring or sleep apnea. I don't suffer from those things, uh, but I just don't take any chances. And I noticed that when I started taping my mouth about five years ago, wow, my sleep was way better, and I needed about an hour less sleep. I seemed to get better oxygenation by absolutely forcing myself to breathe through the nose and it sounds claustrophobic like oh my god you know but it, it's nothing you don't even notice it wow i i was gonna say that kind of sounds like i would get anxiety from that but i should try that because i don't sleep that well so that that might help me i do that every night thanks to you steve and i get amazing sleeps um so as we transition to the close, Taiha has a couple questions that she answers, and I have a couple questions, short questions that are like really from the heart. So we try to we do a breathing exercise with our guests, and since you're an expert at breath, would you guide us through just a short breath exercise to really tap Taiha, myself, and you all in together, unite our minds, our bodies, our spirits together, so that with these last. Um, quick questions that like we're speaking from a place of source of divinity of the God in all of us. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know dozens of breathing exercises. One that I've been using lately is 
uh, one that a Taoist yoga teacher showed me. Uh, this is a real interesting guy. He's a good friend of mine. His name is Stanley Tan. And Stanley was the first black belt, BJJ black belt in China and the head of the Chinese Jiu-Jitsu Federation. He now has moved to Australia, which is a much better place than Shanghai. Mm -hmm. But he had a whole, he had like five schools in Shanghai that he had opened up. But uh, he showed me this really nice breathing exercise. And there's a Western equivalent. It's called rousing the citadels. Basically, and there's an uh, uh, there's a yogi equivalent. So, you know, all these things cross. But basically, I'm breathing into my root chakra through my groin and into my lower back. And I'm lighting up each one of my chakras, my uh, pressure, uh, energy points, as I'm bringing the breath up. It's going up my spine, around my head, and then it circles back down to the groin. So it's like the circle. It's like sealing my energy, and uh, um, I'm energizing each one of those sacred energy points of my body. So I start to slowly inhale. I'm breathing in through the groin. Now the breath is traveling up the back of my spine. It's lighting up my spleen, my solar plexus, my heart chakra, my throat, my third eye, my crown chakra. And now as I exhale, it comes back. So inhale, visualize the chakras, feel the energy going up the spine. You should feel like a little tingling going up into the upper chest, feel the chest, feel your whole lung. And then slowly exhale. And you can feel that energy. The tradition was seven times. So one more time. Slowly inhale. Feel the energy traveling up your spine like a thermometer. Exhale. very relaxing and you're feeling both the lower and upper lobes of the lungs and i always get like this tingling sensation it may take a while to develop that and that is very powerful very energizing uh you know in the western uh construct it's called rousing the citadels they recognize shockers but they they call them something else the the, the word in english is vortex energy <laughs> vortex and in uh, in Hindi, it's you know chakra. Uh, I don't know what the Chinese call those pressure points, but anyway, it's universal. Mm -hmm. It's very good. Uh, I'll do that uh, maybe when I'm laying in bed, last thing before I get up, or sometimes after my cold shower, I do my you know my tapping and my waist twisters and my hip circles and my my neck, you know, <laughs> loosening everything up. And then I'll, 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 I'll sometimes I'll add that breathing exercise up. Very calming, very relaxing, very restorative. Uh, another one that's really good to do when you're working is it's called breathe light to breathe right. You purposely set a timer, usually three to 10 minutes, and you try to breathe as little as possible. You just bring that little groove right underneath the nose. That is there for a purpose. You literally sip the air through the nose up that little groove <laughs> into your nose like and only into the lower lobes of the lungs and then you exhale and you try to see how little air you can take and you should create what they call an oxygen hunger you should feel like you want to breathe more or like you could breathe more like you, you, f you should feel like you're being deprived a little that's very good for building up your tolerance to CO2 Carbon dioxide is what prompts you to breathe. You have CO2 sensors in your upper neck and shoulders. And when the CO2 is released from your cells, you have the urge to breathe. The problem is if you over breathe, you breathe out all the CO2. And you need the presence of CO2 in the cell in order for the cell to take up oxygen. Mm -hmm. So 
basically, you may be breathing in a lot of oxygen, but your cells can't use it because you're exhaling all the carbon dioxide. It's called the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. You can mm -hmm. look that up. It's the Bohr effect. It's a physiologic phenomenon. You must have the presence of carbon dioxide for the cells to take up oxygen. But if you're over breathing, you're breathing out all the CO2. So you could be breathing in a lot and not getting any of the oxygen to the cell. So the breathe light to breathe right, you purposely take as little air as you can. You can do it while you're doing other tasks. Sometimes I do it when I walk. You can do it while you sit. You can do it in an airline, a bus, a car, while watching a video. It, it, it doesn't matter. But that's a very, very good exercise to just mindfully breathe as little as possible. Sometimes I play a little game, and I have this app on my iPhone, and uh, I'll, I'll put my heart monitor on, this uh, Insta heart rate, and you put your finger on the little, yeah, like that, and it shows your heart rate, mm. and right now it's not showing it, there we go. 62. Right now, 62. Yeah, I, I worked out to this. It's a little hot. But I will breathe light to breathe right. And I try to absolutely make my heart rate go as low. Oh, there it goes, 49. It dropped from 62 to 49. Wow. Just consciously making it drop. My normal resting heart rate is usually about 45, 46. Wow. Right on. So we're going to we're gonna. But I, I, I was so excited to see you guys. You, you <laughs> so we're going to be breathing um, lights to breathe right for these last questions. So Taha, wrap it up with Steve. What are your two? And then I'll give him my brief two. All right. So to someone who has just taken the leap to leave the traditional career model and follow their passion, what would be your biggest piece of advice? Visualize. First of all, figure out what it is you want. A lot of people just flounder through life not knowing what they want. It could be something mundane. It could be a house, a tiny house, or a car, or uh, maybe the love of your life, you know, a significant other. Uh, whatever that is, it doesn't matter. But start to visualize that. Start to work in your mind on what it is that you want and stop thinking about what you don't want. Mm -hmm. Everyone's always focused on what they don't want to have happen. You know, that's that fear stuff. So that is a goal. You may get that goal and you may decide you don't want it after all, or it wasn't such a big thing after all. And then you take that next thing. It's best to work at one big thing at a time, not try to do too much, not have three or four different things you're working on, but pick one major. So maybe it's more finances. Maybe it's attracting more money. You know, I was telling people, a lot of people are really scared because they're out of work, you know, jobless right now. But, you know, in truth, money is a spiritual thing. Money is just energy. It, 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 money itself has no worth. It's just paper, right? It, it doesn't mean nothing. It, it, it symbolizes something of value, which is energetic. You know, you do this work and you get paid this money. It's like my energy for the, you know, the, the, what money represents, which is energy. Well, Einstein proved energy can be neither created nor destroyed. So there's just as much money as ever has been. Mm -hmm. There's not less money, not less wealth. You know, the economy may be good down, but it goes up, it goes down, and then it goes up. But the money is always there, always has been there, always will be there. It just changes hands. Mm -hmm. It just changes pockets. There's people making so much money during this pandemic. It's ridiculous. You can be one of those people. You got to figure out how to get that money into your hands, but you don't have to sit there and make a plan or rob a bank. What you do is you visualize it coming to you and avalanches of abundance, wave after wave of visible money supply flows to me. Now I'm inundated with money. My bank account is filled with an all sufficiency to meet every need. I, I'm able to afford and buy all those things that make life enjoyable and worth living. 
I develop a divine surplus, enough to spare, enough to share. These are the things I say to myself. And lo and behold, maybe I'll have a scare. I had three clients drop out. No, four. That was scary. I could have concentrated on the four people that dropped out. Like, oh, my God, people are <laughs> quitting. No one has any work. They're not going to buy my personal training, you know. The, you know, the, the little henny penny, the sky is falling. <laughs> so instead, I put together the law of attraction. Lo and behold, I got four new people. You can't lose. You can't lose. What, there's no such thing as loss. Yeah. There is no loss in the divine plan. You know, <laughs> whatever you lose, it was never yours. And maybe it's just an illusion, the illusion of loss, but there's always something to replace it. Always. So that's what I tell people. You got to develop, and it's all on faith, by the way. You got to have rock solid faith. And the way you develop that faith is constant affirmations and prayers and meditations. And man, damn near miracles happen in my life every day. It could be just a little squirrel on my stoop. That's a miracle of life. Uh, There's a baby fawn. One of my favorite deer had a baby fawn. You know what a miracle that was? Oh, my God. It was so cute. You know, little miracles every single day. It could be something mundane or something really big. Yeah, it's. I'm loving everything that you're saying because this is all what I'm experiencing in my life right now. Reading the magic and just, you know, writing 10 things down every single morning that I'm grateful for. It makes you search for those things that we just take for granted every single day, like the air that we breathe, like... We're so fortunate. It's absolutely insane. And we are all extensions of the universe, like our lives, everything. And if you look in nature, it is so incredibly abundant. The amount of pieces of sand on the beach, like drops of water in the ocean, the immense amount of trees and leaves everywhere. Like there's so much to go around. And it's this fear, fear, fear that we've created for ourselves that we are lacking in anything. And if you believe that, then what are you going to attract? You're going to attract scarcity. If you believe in abundance, you're going to attract abundance. And, and that's something I've so been experiencing because I work right now too, because I normally work in a gym, could have let myself get anxious and be and do but I didn't and that's just kind of me you know we talked about choice and how our thoughts create our reality like that was me choosing to create the experience that I want to have during this quarantine I could have I could have been scared and and then really experienced lack or I could just trust that everything's going to be okay it always is okay um and it's just been a way better time (laughs) believing that so It, it really is a matter of faith you know, people yeah. of little faith, it's going to be hard for them, but you can develop it over time. I recommend people start really small with something they can wrap their minds around and then gradually, you know, there's a saying that uh, you can't attract a million dollars if you only have a thousand dollar consciousness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So start with a hundred dollars. Yeah and get those little victories it's like in jiu-jitsu or wrestling right yeah you you know you 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 don't start out you know going to the toughest guy in the room and 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 whooping their butt the first day yeah you start with guys you know that you can handle a little bit and you build your confidence and you know you you gradually work your way up to the big dogs in the room (laughs) but you know you don't go in and challenge the master black belt first day (laughs) you it's a good way to get thrashed (laughs) <laughs> Even if you have a lot of confidence. So it's the same thing with any of this stuff. You start small and you work your way up the room, mm-hmm. you know, tougher and tougher goals, but it works. The so law good. of attraction. Oh, uh, by the way, that gratitude thing is so important, man. Yeah. People aren't grateful enough. And like Rhonda Byrne says in the book, you can't attract anything better than what you got until you're grateful for what you got. Mm-hmm. Totally. Even, even if you're in a prison cell, you got to find stuff you're grateful for. Miracles yeah. do happen. They happen every day. All right. I got one more question for you. In three words or a phrase, how would you describe the experience that you are having on this earth? Be here now. Mm. Be yeah. here now. Beautiful. I uh, I wasn't always that way. My head would be off 
somewhere else. But now I'm really staying, trying to stay more and more present. Awesome. You know, just not thinking. You know, just like looking and just there's no thought in my mind. Mm-hmm. Like a bird or a squirrel, you're just there. You're just being, just looking being. and just being. And it's, uh, it's been longer and longer periods between thoughts now. I notice like really long periods of time where I'm not really actually thinking. It's really wonderful to have mm-hmm. a clear mind like that. But yeah, be here now. Be in the present. Love it's it. not easy, but you got to, you know, it's like everything else. It's like exercising. Mm-hmm. You got to build your, your, your mind and your consciousness. It wasn't always that way. Mm-hmm. And for my, for my questions, I'm going to fast forward out of the present. I'm going to fast forward us uh, many years in the future. And Steve Maxwell is on his way to his 100 years. And we take a little pause at year 95. Who is that 95-year-old Steve Maxwell? What does life look like for that Steve Maxwell? And what legacy have you left behind? Well, pretty much he's going to be like he is now, just more wrinkled and maybe moving <laughs> a little slower. Wow. Uh, you know, because I, I really believe in the, the principle of forget the past, live in the present, look forward to the future. So whatever that 95-year-old guy will be, he's not going to be thinking about what was or what could have been or should have been. He's going to be like still living in the present and the now and very grateful for whatever he has. And he's going to keep on keeping on exactly like he is now. You know, things, things obviously change. The only thing you can be sure of in this life is change, but he's going to deal with those things and he's going to be very grateful for whatever he has. And at that point, I'll be ready to die. You know, (laughs) no, seriously, Uh, people are so afraid of death. They don't want to talk about it, Mm -hmm. but you got to make peace with that. You know, I I picked a hundred just as, as an arbitrary number. But it doesn't matter if I only make it a 79 or 89. It doesn't matter. No one really knows. But the idea was I wanted to extend my time on this earth because I feel like I had some karmic debt to clean up a little bit. I felt like I still had spiritual growth that I would like to have. I'd like to get off this merry-go-round of reincarnation, you know, be able to get off the merry-go-round. I don't know whether I'll do it this time or not. But I think if I had like another three decades or so, I think I would get pretty close. Mm-hmm. Have you Maybe. read? Maybe. Have you read? In uh, I just read this book, and what you're talking about reminds me of it. It's called "Many Lives, Many Masters." It's about past lives, and what you were saying just was all what it is about. So, <laughs> I was just wondering. I hadn't read that book, but you know, I, I've I've known enough Buddhists. <laughs> but you know, there is a Christian tradition of also, mm-hmm. uh, the, you know. Uh, the hardcore Bible thumper evangelicals don't look at any of this stuff, but there is a group of uh, people that uh, practice Christian mysticism, you know, like uh, Ernest Holmes and some of these uh, new thought Christians. And they, they see everything uh, in the Bible as a meta- metaphor. Like none of those events happened. Those people really existed. They're metaphors for higher truths. Hmm. You know what got me back into Christianity was a yogi. Yogananda. Mm-hmm. Yogananda wrote this outstanding book. I'd recommend any, anybody read it, called, whether you're Christian or not, called The Second Coming, mm-hmm. where he talked about the, the teachings of Christ and the metaphysical meanings, and he did a, an amazing job. And it was so uh, amazing that it got me back into the religion of my youth, Christianity. And... I, I, but I look at it way different than I did back then, mm-hmm. you know, way different. Uh, you know, no, no, I see it always a metaphor. Neville talks about this. Neville, and uh, he, he also uh, deciphers Christian verse metaphorically. It's amazing metaphors for all the truth. But there's other books out there too, the Bhagavad Gita. There's, you know, there's a lot of amazing texts, you know, out there mm-hmm. that uh, people can study. But yeah, Steve Maxwell at 95 is going to be not a whole lot different than he is now. <laughs> I can't keep that youthful, that, 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 that boy alive, you know? <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. I know that that's going to happen. Now we're going to rewind time. 
And now we're at 36 year old Steve Maxwell and that's the age I am now. And we're not going to change the 36 year old Maxwell because the journey that you've been on has led you to you. And you are someone I really look up to. And I know there's so many around the world that you've inspired and you continue to inspire. But what would you give your advice to me as a 30, 36 year old man um, on this path? Don't take things seriously. Really just don't take things so seriously realize that none of this matters actually the whole the whole life is an illusion enjoy the illusion live in it but just realize it's just all an illusion you can create whatever you want it's like being in the matrix but now you're awake so wake up and create the life you want take the green pill or the blue pill you know <laughs> and enjoy that you know I, I, I like that one scene in The Matrix where the guy says, man, this reality sucks. You know, give me a pill and make me rich. And oh, and give me a beautiful wife. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do that in your mind. Well, you, 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 you can create that reality. So I would just talk to my old, old self and just don't get so serious about stuff. Don't worry. Be happy. Don't take things so seriously. Realize everything will always work out for the best in the end. I really do believe everything works out for the best. Ultimately, there's going to be goodness in any situation. Even the quarantine, as traumatic as it's been for some people, it, it's going to work out for the best in the long run. And there's some people, there are people thriving right now. There are people that are really thriving. People that have put off their fitness programs, they're more fit than they've ever been in their life. Uh, there's people making money hand over fist in some industries. You know, it's always there. Like I said, money's always the same. It just changes mm -hmm. pockets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once the economy gets up and running again, you know, it'll change back to other pockets. But to worry about it, it does nothing other than create sickness and ill health. Concentrating on all those fears, concentrating on, you know, and worries that you you just basically manifest the thing that you fear most. So yeah. get rid of them, man. Judo throw those negative thoughts. Judo throw, man. <laughs> throw them right in the canal. You got to look at it. It's, it's called Segura, a Judo Saga by uh, uh, Kurosawa. I got it. Well, we've got yeah, awesome. so many gems. You'll enjoy it. So many gems as wisdom from this conversation. And if it wasn't for quarantine, um, this conversation would have never happened. I would have never attended your first ever webinar, which was there we go. <laughs> amazing, which connected us. And um, I hope just like you have with Joe Rogan and with Brian Rose, continue the conversation. We hope to continue this conversation with you as we evolve. Sure, I'll, co I'll come back anytime. It would be great. <laughs> Excellent. So where can people right. find you? Uh, the, my website is Maxwell SC, S for strength. C for conditioning. Maxwell S C uh, dot com. Mm -hmm. I almost forgot my website for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Maxwell C dot com. And uh, there's contact information on there if you want to contact me. Uh, I do have openings for uh, online personal training. Uh, I, I actually had a note that I didn't, but that's just changed recently. I need got to take that off there. So I have a couple of spots open for anyone that would like to uh, start training online. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm here in Port Townsend. So I have been doing consultations. Uh, I've been doing, uh, people come to me to learn the various exercise systems I have. I've had people coming in from Seattle and different places around those areas. And once the quarantine lifts, I'm sure uh, more and more people will be coming in. If the uh, SBG gym in Port Townsend opens back up, I have like some equipment in there that uh, I, I train people on. And uh, I started to do private jujitsu mm -hmm. for people that want to, especially the Gracie self-defense. That's an aspect of jujitsu that a lot of people don't know. The actual self-defense street fight version mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. jujitsu is uh, pretty important stuff. Absolutely. And we'll have to talk about that our next time. Um, we're so grateful for your time. Um, this is something that I envisioned, I visualized. And my dream has become a reality. And that's learning from one of the masters, someone I've respected so much. Um, I can't recommend Steve's videos enough. Go on there, find something that interests you. They're all gold. Um, 
gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Maxwell. Let's raise our fists up in the air in love, in truth, in solidarity, and let's bring it in to the winner's circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get all go. we get all Fish bump. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. There are so many pieces of gold and just stuff that I think isn't normally talked about when, you know, personal trainers, jujitsu, but we got to some really deep stuff. And I, I really appreciated everything that you had to share and look forward to hopefully talking with you again soon. For sure. Good luck. I hope your back feels better soon. Thank you so 